going to have a sampling of each of the working groups. We're going to have the leaders of those small working groups come up and present on what their working group is about and some of the findings, if any, that they've attained so far. And just to keep in mind, uh, these small working groups are thus again a step down of our advisory team and what they work on, once more just to reiterate, are uh, needs that are identified and driven by discussions um, on our conference calls and that stemmed from the 2012 workshop. And completion of these products or attaining uh, of information throughout this pro project or these projects is helping provide the foundation for the work that we do and the future work that uh, we see fit. So the first presentation is going to be on the liter literature database, the Prairie Literature Database. And the presenter is Cammie Dixon. She's the zone biologist for the Dakotas in Region 6 of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, Cammie, you're up. Thank you, Becky, and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be spending just a few minutes here talking about our literature review team. I want to acknowledge other members of my team. First of all, Greg Hope from Minnesota DNR. Are you here, Greg? And then uh, Diane Larson with U.S. Geological Survey, who will be presenting in a few more minutes. So first of all, our purposes of this subgroup are twofold. One is to query the literature to identify prominent information gaps. And number two is to direct and prioritize research based on these identified gaps. So how are we going to go forth and achieve these purposes? The first thing we were going to do, and I apologize, I'm sure this is looking very small up here. Um, what, what we first did is we needed a way for us to literally put all of the literature pub and publications that we had in one place. So we used EndNote, which is a reference management system. I don't know if anyone has used these sorts of tools before, but this is a way that Diane, Greg, and I could literally put all of our publications that we had on reconstruction in one library. That big arrow on the screen I'm pointing to, we have a library of 417 publications that we were able to get together. Our next step, once we had all those publications together, of course, 417 is overwhelming considering we had three of us that in theory needed to read through all of them, right? So we needed a way to wade through these. So what we did is you'll see on the left hand of the screen is a keyword search. We came up with about 65 different keywords that we literally were going to search within that EndNote library. So everything you see, I just, I just clipped out kind of the first 10 or 15 that we had, A, a through E roughly. Um, so like allelopathy was one example that we went in and searched. Um, and we also made sure our keywords, uh, we used multiples. So for burn, which is up on the screen here now, we also had fire, prescribed fire, and that sort of thing. Our goal was, after we, after we used all these keywords to search, was to fit the publications that we found into one of those categories on the right. So whether it's site selection, seed, site prep, seed mix, planting method, or post-seeding management. So let me give you an idea of what this looked like. So this is a, an example, and again, I apologize, this is very small, but for example, the keyword search was birds. So as we queried those 417 publications, as you'll see on the far left side, we came across 14 publications that referred to birds in one way or another. Once we waded through those publications, we found two that were pertinent to those, uh, those five categories that we had laid out. There is one related to seed mix, the Hefley et al. 2013, and then one related to seeding the Howitt Brown 1999. So again, we are still in the process of doing this for all of these 65 keywords and wading through those 417. We have several done, but we still need to tie up the loose ends to, to get it totally complete so that we have a complete database and that it'll look like, like this, this screen that I have on the, on, the, on the PowerPoint. So where do we go from here? We still have to finalize this. I, I think we can probably wrap it up here in the next six months or so. I, I have someone who can actually help do some of the more detailed work now. 
So we should be to a point where we have this database with all of these different keywords and all of these different publications. And then we need to do some sort of facilitated session to really wade through and figure out where those information gaps are so then we can help our partners like Diane Larson, Jack Norland, really help us do the research that we need to address our data gaps. Are there any questions or comments so far? Okay, thank you. Maybe how could people get, is it possible for people to get the end note? Okay, so the, the question is, is it possible, if you have access to EndNote, is it possible to get that EndNote library shared with you? It, it is a little bit of a challenge because you have to enter individual emails specifically, but I encourage you to talk to me if you do want this resource and we can try to work something out. Eventually we'll make this accessible to everyone, but some of those 417 publications aren't pertinent, so we're really trying to wade through that and get that cleaned up a little bit. But we're willing to share if you do have that interest immediately. Thank you. Okay, um, before we go to our next presentation, just one little housekeeping uh, detail. We're gonna try to get the PowerPoint presentations put up on a website, our Eastern Tall Grass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Cons oh, LCC, oh my goodness, um, uh, website. So we'll get that uh, website address to you before the end of the day, but please keep in mind you'll be able to access these presentations um, outside of, of the room today. Yeah, well, and then there'll be a reminder. So once they're actually posted, just give us some time to do that, and then we'll send out a reminder. Okay, and, and we have all your contact information, so we'll send out a reminder or a, kind of a, a email message when, when those are up and ready. Okay, next. Um, we have a change in presenter. We're going to have Sarah Vosick from the Morris Wetland Management District today introduce you to a topic that I think is near and dear probably to everybody uh, here in this room. Um, and it's webinars and field tours. Maybe not the webinars so much, but the field tours. Uh, we, what we did as a group, and we, we, we asked these questions of an even out, uh, a larger outside uh, query of folks. What is the, the top thing that we can, we can do together um, to learn from our experiences in prairie reconstruction besides listening to webinars or working on collaborative research projects? And again, an overwhelming uh, majority said field visits, right? We work with our partners, we work with our staff, we work with our co-located uh, other you know, agency um, field stations on a lot of the same things, but a lot of times we don't go out in the field and have discussions, meaningful discussions together. And so one thing our group decided to do was try to facilitate some of these uh, field tours um, in, in different geographical locations. And so Sarah is going to talk about those next. All right, thanks, Becky. Um, so like Becky mentioned, and I think we all say it, and we've heard it a few times probably already this morning, is that there certainly is an art and there's a science, right, to kind of components to prairie reconstructions. Um, and not all of us are really great at staying as connected as we can to the current science that's out there. Um, and when we think about the art component, that's something that we sometimes tend to kind of work in our own little zone of influence, maybe with a couple of neighboring agencies or, or offices um, without talking to the bigger community. And as we talked about this morning already, one thing that we really wanted to try to accomplish with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative was this idea of learning together how to do this whole thing better collaboratively. How can we work together better to get at some of these questions? And um, after we had that really great um, kickoff workshop in, at Neil Smith Refuge a few years ago, one idea that came out was to try to have a meeting kind of like this every year where we'd have a chance for everyone to get together and share their experiences and give updates on research and that kind of thing. Um, but we have, as Becky showed that map, we've got a huge geography, there's a long distance for people to travel, um, of all the folks who may be interested in this kind of thing. Um, and also we just started having a lot of us some decline, pretty seriously declining budgets. Um, and so thinking about all of those things in, in, in that context, one thing that seemed like a great idea was to do some of these more local, regional-focused field days. 
where we would um, get together at whichever location people were willing to offer up and get together in the field and share information with each other. So, um, did you mention that Thomas was supposed to do this? Yeah. Okay. So, I have some slides that Tom Skilling actually put together about some of the field tours that we did. We're going to try to do a little short five minute video that kind of provides a little synopsis of uh, one of the tours that we had this summer out of Morris. But before I forget, I also want to just mention the field trips are really fun and it's really neat to be out in the field together and looking at these reconstructions. But we also have been trying to put on sort of quarterly webinar um, uh, lectures, I guess. Um, we've done a handful of them. I was trying to remember off the top of my head this morning. We had uh, Sarah Baer gave a presentation about the importance of using local ecotype seed. Um, we had Elizabeth Bach give a talk to us a few months ago about soil microfauna and the role that we're learning that some of those little critters in the soil play in our success of our reconstructions. Um, Wedge Watkins with the uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service in Missouri actually gave a presentation about a bee survey that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing at some of our different refuge offices in the Midwest. Um, and there have been maybe a couple more that I can't think of off the top of my head. Both with these field days and with the webinars, we are really open to any ideas that you folks might have about what would be interesting topics. Um, that's how we've come up with all these ideas so far, is just somebody saying, hey, what about X, Y, Z, and, and that's where we landed. So please feel free to get in touch with one of us on the advisory team if you've got ideas for webinars, um, information that you think would be really helpful, uh, experiences that you've had that you'd be willing to share with folks. We really appreciate those ideas coming in from, from you. So a few sort of highlights, I guess, that we see from these field tours. One is just this idea of having time to be together, face to face, standing out in the middle of a prairie, talking about um, what we were trying to do on that site. Um, how well are these? Um, we've had at least two the last couple years. We've done a couple out of our office down in Morris. We've done one up in the Detroit Lakes area. There were a couple down in Iowa over the last couple years. Um, sometimes we try to have them be focused on a specific topic. Sometimes we've kind of tried to step through different phases of reconstructions. It's really kind of up to the office that's hosting or the folks that are hosting the field day what they want that focus to be about. Um, and so it's varied quite a bit across the different, different projects. We feel like it's this sort of getting together in person is a really great way to stimulate some discussion of actual events that have happened, right? So what's really been, um, what's worked for us, what hasn't worked for us to actually get out together and look at, okay, here's a prairie where we're looking at it five years down the road and we feel like it's looking pretty good. What do you think? Here's one that maybe didn't work out quite the way we planned and kind of ex exchange some ideas and thoughts with each other about why that might be. Um, Definitely, we've got a lot of folks who um, have tons of experience through their careers doing reconstructions at their local site, and again, maybe haven't had really the venue to be able to share their information or their working knowledge with other folks, and so it's a great chance to be able to get together um, and learn lessons that others have already learned. One thing that's been eye-opening for us, when we uh, put together our first one at uh, Morris, we were thinking of it and envisioning it as being sort of an opportunity to share information with each other, so to get together with, with equally experienced practitioners and, and exchange information about what had worked and what hadn't worked for us. And the first one that we put on at Morris, we were pretty surprised at the number of really new young professionals that showed up, and so it ended up being kind of JV mostly just talking the whole time, which was great, um, but it was, you know, we had a number of farm bill biologists and, and really young professionals that were just getting started in all this, and it was a great chance for them to get out and, and learn a little bit about what we'd been doing at Morris over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, but we've also had some very experienced people show up, and, and I would say that we've certainly learned from, from everyone on these, so it's nice to have people with all different skill levels and backgrounds. I think this picture is hilarious. <laughs> what are you guys looking at there? <laughs> Pondering. This, look, can you see the picture? Yeah. Oh. Ah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It was just fun. Yeah. Pondering the ditch. Oh, it was erosion. Yeah, it was some innovative stuff and in figuring out how to uh, prevent erosion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, hence the, the information on the slide there is that these field tours do provide us a chance to take a really specific focused topic like that and talk about reconstruction in that context. Um, you know, we had some of our discussion at the one at Morris this year related to some research that we'd done trying to prevent Canada thistle from taking over in our reconstructions, and so that was real sort of focused um, ability to get together and talk about those, those topics. And you can't do this on a webinar, and you can't do this at meetings like this, but to actually stand out there in the prairie and look at a real-life reconstruction, look around and see you know, on this side of the fence, we've got a lot of blazing star, and on this side of the fence, we don't, and have a chat with each other about what, what's going on there. That's, I think there's a really a lot of value in that, so it's, uh, that's been, I think, probably one of the most fun parts for me is to see different projects that people have. So we are going to try to do this video. Unfortunately, the sound only comes through the microphone, so I'm going to have to hold the microphone on. The <laughs> so let me know if it's just not working. Can you can you maximize the size? Quite a bit, and 
funds to do for overlap as far as what's in. So I guess that's my general view of it. A good seating overall, lots of diversity, nice mix. One big, great, big, big pollinator fund here. You know, you get a lot of stuff blooming. Obviously, all season long, there's stuff that's post bloom stuff that's yet to bloom, and stuff that's blooming. So we're here at the uh, Prairie Reconstruction Initiative Field Day, and um, with John Kloss, we're going to do kind of a little video uh, interview of the, what he's learned or has questions about. So if you were to, uh, able to monitor some of these components of a Prairie Reconstruction, uh, what would they be? Uh, one, I'd, I'd like to really monitor for diversity, but then I'd also want to really keep an eye on... Um, just like like we said before, trees and, and weeds coming back and undesirables. undesirables and seeing what kind of thresholds we're seeing out there um, and, and try to come up with a, a, an estimate of where, where we really need to focus our efforts on, on that threshold. So. All right, thanks. Amen. Here with Larry Martin from the Fergus Falls Wetland Management District. And um, Larry, uh, what have you learned today so far that you think you'll apply to future reconstructions? Well, it, it definitely looks like the, you know, the seeding where this denser with the forbs is keeping out uh, Kentucky bluegrass and some of the, the non-natives that we want to try and keep out. So it's, it's sort of like most of the, the tracks that you keep looking at, the, the broader the diversity, the better chance we have of keeping, keeping out the undesirables. Okay. All right. Uh... What is one thing that you'll take away today that will guide what you do? What is one question that was not answered or that came up during the day that you will be mulling over or you'd like to see addressed in a future Prairie Restoration Initiative field day? Dennis. Um, I don't know that we have the data to support it, but I kind of noticed this today and I, I heard other folks talking about it. Sarah's husband in particular, Kurt, I've heard him go off about it. We have some of these mixes that are really, really high diversity when we put them in the ground, but we tend not to see a lot of that stuff out there. And why? You know, nobody really knows why that is. Um, you know, my sense is it's the more conservative stuff and, and it's the little bitty, tiny, tiny seeds, but, and things that are planted because they're spending, they're planted at fairly low rates. But I, I think, I wonder if we are not, we're, we're not getting the diversity that we want to get out of the seed mixes that we're putting in the ground, and, and why is that? Right. Um, are we doing wrong? Or? Well, one thing where I think we're all pretty ignorant about is the mycorrhizal component in the soil. And there, there might be uh, a lot more requirement from those more rare things, you know, um, and that just takes a while for to build up that, that biota in that soil community. So, you know, or if there's a species inter interdependency or something like that. Right. So hopefully that just gives you a short glimpse of kind of the communication and the dialogue that we have going on at some of these field days. Um, what really jumped out at me was all the green and the insects and the flowers, all the color. Kind of forgot that we have so much color out here. Um, big thanks to JV for putting that together. I think it, it does provide a good uh, sort of insight if you haven't been on one of these field tours. And again, we really encourage people to let us know if you have ideas, um, if you'd be willing to host one of these field days. Um, or if you have ideas for webinars, please do get in touch with us. Um, aside from that, does anyone have any questions about how these work? Or? Okay, thanks. All right, uh, our next small working group is the demonstration of the new Prairie Reconstruction Database, and Cammie's going to join us back to introduce you to that. And this was something that, again, 
we have been looking and wanting and, and a lot of folks, you know, when you hear the, the word standardization, sometimes we get the, you know, we tense up a little bit, but uh, you'll see the power in standardization when it comes to collection, collecting a lot of the information related to factors in prairie reconstruction, and you'll see that um, importance even more as Diane uh, follows up with the um, the research project uh, talk. But first, we'll have Cami come up again. Thanks, Becky. I first want to make sure that my co-presenter, Vicki Hunt, is on the line. Vicki, are you there? Hold on just a second, Vicki. We're adjusting your volume. Can you can you talk to us again, Vicki? Hello. Can you hear me now? How is that in the back room? Do I need to hold the microphone up? If you put the mic closer, then she can, we can hear. Okay, that sounds good. I'll, I'll do that when we get there. So I first want to tell you, Vicki Hunt is co-presenting with me. Vicki is with the Chicago Botanic Garden and is our database expert. So Vicki will be talking on a few slides here. I also want to acknowledge acknowledge the other team members. This has been kind of an interesting team because we've needed different expertise and input along the way, so you'll see there's several of us on that list, including Pauline, Kyle Kelsey, Diane Larson, Jack Norland, and Karen Visty sparkman And I hope I didn't miss anyone because there's been, been a lot of folks who have helped out with this along the way. So first of all, I want to talk just a little bit about the impetus for creating a centralized type database, and I just want to see how these pictures turned out. Does one of them look much better than the other from the back, I hope? <laughs> the idea is we are trying to figure out what's the difference when you get the prairie on the right side of the screen with the smiley face, versus, which is a huge success. Hopefully you can see that that's a, a nice reconstructed prairie doing what it's supposed to out there. And then you have the picture on the left, which if you can't see, there's a lot of thistle going to seed and there's wormwood in there. That one's less successful and we aren't quite as happy at the end of the day. So Pauline articulated this really nice at the end of the day, but, but what's the difference between getting the end point, the outcome on the right, versus the outcome on the left? A lot of us have mental models or ideas how this happen, how this might happen. The whole concept of doing a centralized database is to try to archive and actually document what we're doing so that we can do thorough evaluations in the end and hopefully end up having more outcomes like the picture on the right. On the left. Oh, goodness. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Struggling with my rights and lefts today. Thank you, JB. You get the idea with the, with the happy and the sad face. I hope the emoticons helped on that one. <laughs> so here are our two purposes for building a, a centralized database. Purpose number one is to archive reconstruction, implementation, and management data. And then purpose number two is to archive monitoring data to help inform our management. Now, as this team has worked on this, we know it's really important to balance the data quality and the user friendliness. First of all, with the data quality, we need to make sure what we put in in the database that we can roll that up someday and really make sense of it in a scientifically sound way. With the user friendliness, of course, if this is too clumsy or awkward or hard to use, none of us are gonna wanna use it, right? So those are two factors that those of us on this team are really focused on. We're fortunate because we have great partners with the Chicago Botanic Garden who have uh, lots of experience with developing these uh, standardized databases and making them user friendly. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki Hunt right now who's going to talk a little bit about uh, standardized databases and where we're going with this particular database. Okay, go ahead, okay. Vicki. Okay, um, is the microphone working? We're good. Okay. Um, thank you, Cami, for that introduction. And as Cami mentioned, um, I work for the Chicago Botanic Garden, and I'm a consultant with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I develop uh, databases and data management systems. Um, and for this project, um, the slide shows the setup that we're looking to build for data management systems, where management data would be collected in the field and entered um, by all cooperators um, all over the study area into one centralized database. And this uh, database would post all of that data online. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. And 
currently we have the data centralization uh, portion of the system running in a prototype form. The opportunity, um, once we have the data set, um, once we have the data centralized, is that we can use that data for analysis and uh, from this analysis we can generate results that will help uh, learn more about the prairie construction. And this uh, results can then be disseminated back to the cooperator. And uh, using the online component of the data management system where cooperators are able to enter the data, they can also then retrieve the results from the same place. And so um, hopefully this sort of setup is <coughs> convenient for, um, for people to both enter the data and then also to pick up results. The front end of the system that we're working on is um, web-based, so all of the data entry is online. And this is nice because it means that there is no special um, requirement for any particular software. The data entry will be done through a web browser of um, your choosing, and uh, preferably Internet Explorer just because this is a website that's designed um, with SharePoint and Internet Explorer is the recommended browser, but really any browser will do. And um, in the slides, you can see the home page for the data uh, data entry website. So this would be the, the web page that you'd be greeted with if you were to go and enter um, data into the prototype as it is now. And there are links to a bunch of different um, forms where you would be able to fill in your data. So the front end and the, the, um, the part of the tool that uh, you would enter data into is online, as I mentioned. And then on um, behind the scenes, so to speak, there's a relational database. And this is the uh, component of the data management system that would be useful for analysis. Um, and relational database, all that really means is that there's a uh, uniform and enforced relationship between different tables that store different sorts of data um, in the system. And for example, one way you could think about this is if you had a table uh, with U.S. states and then a table with um, counties and then a table with zip codes, there would be a relationship between um, fields that would store the U.S. state name and then the, uh, there would be um, several counties that would have the same state, and then there would be several zip codes that would have the same county. So there would be an enforced relationship between the tables. And this is a way to um, help with standardizing the data, which is important for later analysis. Also, one benefit to centralizing data and using um, online data entry, where everybody could be entering data in the same way is that we can have some uh, quality control on the data itself and we can make sure that everybody is entering the same sort of data and that it's comparable. For example, when, uh, one way that this can be done is through the use of standardized field types, um, for example, with drop-downs. So if we have a drop-down, for example, for a planting method rather than a text um, box where you could write in, then we can have a standardized list you can go to the next slide, please. And so we can have a standardized list, and then we can um, make sure that we're collecting data in the same way across everybody who is um, able to enter their data through the website. And I'll hand it back over to Kami. Um, I also will be on the call at the end of this um, portion, and so if there are any questions that the audience has about um, databases or technical questions, um, I'd be happy to answer those. Thanks. Thank you, Vicki. So I'm going to talk just a little bit on this slide of the actual information that we hope to gather in this centralized database. And as you can see, I have those uh, four categories that you should be kind of getting used to now. Number one is site information, site prep, seeding, and post-seeding management. 
So and as Vicki showed on her previous slides, there's drop down lists built in with pick lists. So you know, if I accidentally misspell a word, it's not going to go into the database wrong or so on. So in site information, data that's required for that section is things like unit name, the boundary. We need the spatial connection there. For site prep, prior land use, was this in brome and thistle for the last 30 years before we went into seabed prep, or has this been in cropland for the past 30 years? That type of information. And then what seabed preparation methods are you using? Are you using a crop rotation with corn and soybeans, or are you doing camp fallow? What, what exactly are you doing? And then the associated details with all that information. So as far as the specific seeding, uh, this is really, uh, we talked about sort of a lot of the meat of this in, in capturing what we're actually putting in the ground out, right, out there, right? So with the origin, the species, the seeding rate, all those types of things that, that we want to capture, and even the, the timing and the methods. Post-seeding management, what are we doing after we put the seed in the ground? Are we going out there and clipping? Are we burning? Are we grazing? Are we mowing? Whatever we're doing, um, it's important to capture that type of information. So what is our timeline here? So currently, we are working this winter and this spring to make edits to the initial version of the database, and then we're going to test run. Summer, fall of 2016, we anticipate that the, data, the database will be ready to pilot. And so we will have a couple of folks put some real world data in, see if there's any bugs we need to iron out, and so forth. We expect that by early in 2017, this will be ready for prime time and rolled out to whoever wants to use it. So that's all we have. Again, Vicki is still on the line too, so uh, please ask any questions or provide any comments that you may have at this time. All right, thank you. Can I just oh, there's some questions in the back. Oh, oh Jack. Well, this is a comment. So I worked on this issue for a while, and I have a real selfish reason for this, because I did, I did try and look at a bunch of uh, restorations or reconstructions here in the past, and I'll tell you, trying to find information on those was, well, poor graduates, which is right, that's in the old files. And really, this is really important. If we want to have evidence-based evidence methods of practice that we can come up with a good practice and best practices, if we don't do this, and really take this to heart. It's really going to be difficult to ever find that kind of information. I know some folks have been doing a better job and stuff, but really this this is so important in the future to do this. I just I just want to say please do it. I don't ever have to well, I'm get to the point where I'm not going to do it. Again. Please don't so nobody else has to go through files and wonder what 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 did they mean by this and try and guess and you know maybe that actually skewed some of the data and so we came up with this will be a great system to, to, to utilize and become so much better. Thank you, and I'll, I'll try to reiterate that comment so everyone on the phone can hear it too. But uh, Jack is making that comment from working with us so much in Region 6, and we'll present him all this monitoring data, but then we'll say, well, we don't know what we did. So, so that's where he's getting that comment. But what he's saying is that it's, it's really hard as one of our research partners if he can go out there and look at the current state of our reconstruction, but if we can't tell him what, what we seeded in there, what plants we seeded in there, what management we've done in the past, and, and that sort of thing, it's, it's really frustrating. And Jack's talking about um, his grad student, Tyler Larson, who works for TNC. I'm not sure if Tyler's here today, but Tyler was, um, <laughs> was literally going through file folders and uh, trying to assemble post-it notes that we had information and data on. So there's a real need to have this organized in such a way that we can easily do evaluations that, again, are going to help us get that better look prairie get the the smiley face prairie that I had on the slide can I make a comment absolutely so one of the things if we think that it's important to do good quality prairie reconstructions if we want to really have uh, something turn out the way we want it we need to know what it what what went in the ground we need to know how it's done there's there's all kinds of information in the background on this database too that involves rainfall and all kinds of things that's automatically entered into that database. So you don't have to do that. But what you do need to do, what we need to do as practitioners is discipline ourselves, find a way to get that information written down in this database is going to give us a place to put it. It's going to give us a place to put it. One of the things that we have a problem with in, as somebody who's been involved with trying to help 
uh, figure out what what um, what you know with some of our researchers how how what happened you know what is the thing that's making the things the, these kind of things work or not work is I also understand that we can make a plan and we can put that plan together and and we can retrieve that plan perhaps even people who have an organized system of record keeping. Uh, we could give it to Jack, we could give it to Diane Larson, or some other researcher, um, or we could do the data analysis ourselves, but what happens in the field? You get the tractor operator out there, and there's a whole bunch of tree stumps up, out there where she or he thought they were going to be planting. Well, they can't plant that then, so that changes the prescription, that changes the what we actually do. Somebody, the somebody, um, Somebody uh, quit their job. You know, the tractor operator quit their job, so we have to wait until next year to do it. Or it's so frickin' rainy out there, you know, you get a, a year where you're underwater and you need some kind of inflatable boat to sew your seat. It, you know, so it doesn't work always the way we think it's gonna work. You know, this, we ran out of seed on this planting, so we have to do something else. Those things happen, that's fair. It's, it, but we need to write that stuff down too. So we need to find an easy, something that's user friendly. So what the attempt is to do here, because we need to fill those gaps as well. And then what happens afterwards? You know, when did we burn? When did we spray? All that kind of stuff. So I mean, I feel kind of passionately about. I can't believe I'm saying I feel passionate about a database, <laughs> but it's it's important because if we don't know what we did, we can't learn from it. And if a whole bunch of people put data in the database, even if you don't get the ability to do monitoring, if we can get some kind of uh, an, uh, uh, funding in, to, to, to do some monitoring later, we may be able to include your work in this analysis. So, but you have to, it's kind of like, you know, the lottery, you can't win if you don't play. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. One more question, Kurt? How do you envision the uh, results? Is it going to be in a narrative of management the question is, how do we anticipate the results of this database being rolled out? And just to clarify the um, your question, Kurt, you're talking about in terms of once we put monitoring data in there and that sort of thing. Is that what you're? The way I understood it is, when you're putting data in, results are coming out, you're applying those results, putting more data in, and finding everything. The simple answer to that is, that's part of our decisions today and the rest of the week of where we really want to go with this. Um, if anyone else on the team would like to add more to that, or is comfortable saying more, I, I welcome them at this time. But just in the short term, there will be research partners who will be able to use the data because it's in a standardized format. So that's kind of the short term answer, and then the long term is hopefully, possibly, some other kind of iterative learning adaptive management. Sure, just to uh, repeat that for folks on the phone, uh, right now we see that we have research partners like Diane and Jack doing retrospective type analyses using this type of data. Uh, we aren't, we're still need to uh, work on the potential of using sort of an iterative type process to you know, manage, monitor, evaluate that, that sort of thing, whether we want to do that or how we want to go forth with that. But they'll be able to download their own management information that they put in. Maybe that's what the question is. Absolutely, yeah. You'd be able to download your own management information that you put in there. And there'd be um, short kind of summaries of, that, you, that are built right into the database. All right. Thank you. Okay, we have one final presentation, and our, our presenter is Diane Larson, and she's a researcher from, with the USGS Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center, and she's officed in St. Paul, and she will be speaking today on a really exciting project that kicked off just this past year, and, and it's a retrospective analysis of prairie reconstruction. So, Diane? Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Um, so 
so this is kind of going to address a little bit of the last question as well. I didn't want to just sit there and try to say it when I was going to have a whole presentation about what we hope to do with these kind of data, given enough data over time. So this was a big project, and we just, Amanda, when did you finish the data entry? It was a couple of months ago. So, so what I have to show you today is is kind of how we set up the study, and it, it really is hand in glove with the database. So we're trying to see how we can improve the fields in the database so we actually can use them for research in the future, and then look at what kinds of, of um, useful information we can glean from analyzing these retrospective kind of data. So you can, how is this showing up? Can you see? Pretty yep. much, you can see. Um, so, so we had a lot of people involved. Uh, Marissa is not here. She's with the Nature Conservancy, and she was a big part of the study for the Glacial Ridge data. Um, Becky's been working with us. Karen Misty Sparkman right here has been working with us from Neil Smith, um, and Pauline as well. And our field crew, Amanda McCulpin, who has now morphed into the, um, what did you call it? Yeah. Product coordinator project coordinator for the PRIOT, so um, she's, we're glad to have her with us. Ian Drobny, Saskia Rather, and Drew Larson, they were our field crew last year. We had two at Neil Smith and two down at um, Glacial Ridge. So first of all, the goal, uh, we want to improve prairie reconstruction. That's pretty simple. Um, we want to develop the criteria by which we say what is a successful prairie reconstruction, and obviously we don't do that completely through research. That's partly what you all believe is um, an attribute of a successful reconstruction. We want to relate the criteria um, to planting and management actions so that we can actually get a relationship between um, what you see as successful and what we do to achieve that success. We want to work with the database developers and make sure that the um, the database is compatible with those goals, and we want to provide SOPs eventually, standard operating procedures, so everybody has an idea of at least how we decided to do these <coughs> monitoring protocols, so you can apply them if you want to, um, but that, that's sort of in the future um, if you choose to adopt the system. And I, also, I can show you what we did, but that's not the final word on what's going to be um, ultimately the best monitoring procedure, but it worked for us, I think. So our study sites, um, we had two where we, we felt that there were enough data sort of available and records were complete enough that we could sort of do um, sort of a mock-up of a retrospective analysis that would come out of this database. So we're kind of trying to kick-start the database um, as, and just and show what actually can happen with it. So since we only have the data for a couple of months, I can't show you results, and I'm very sorry for that. I wish I could. So I'm, I'm just going to be showing you kind of how it's set up and what we're trying to do at this point. So Neil Smith was established in 1990. Um, it has silty clay loam. It's got interconnected swales and hilltops. So that was one sort of end of the continuum. And then we chose Glacial Ridge, which is another site um, that's very different from Neil Smith. So that was good. We had two different, different configurations. It was established by TNC in 2000. And uh, it's sandy and gravelly beach ridges and separated uh, by fine sand, silt, and clay in some wet areas. So we had two very different sites to work in. So we can kind of test how, how this retrospective is going to work and how the database could work in two sites that are really quite different. But they both have good data. So um, we only choose management units that have been construction, con reconstructed within the range of 2002 to 2012. That was just to keep from, from using really new reconstructions, which wouldn't be very, um, very well, you just don't know what's going to happen after the first couple of years. Um, we had to have known seeding and management history, which um, it turns out known history is, means different things to different people, but, <laughs> but we, we've got, we're working on that, we're working on that. Um, we had a goal of 40 sites per refuge, and um, we, 
delineated sample polygons, uh, and I'll show you a slide of this later, but we try to use water retention properties like sand, silt, and clay sorts of, of ideas. Water retention properties as, um, so we're not comparing apples to oranges. When we look at, at the success of a restoration, we wanted to, you know, if it's a, if it's a, a clay soil, it's going to have a different successful seeding than a sandy soil is going to have. So we wanted to take that into con consideration, which is where we run into problems with the management units in some situations. So what, what this is showing you is kind of the data that, that Jen Larson, she was our, our putting all this together in a database, um, in a GIS uh, database for us. What this is showing you, I don't know if I can, is there a way to, can you see the arrow? <coughs> Yep. Okay. Whoops. So what this what this is showing you um, is kind of our at Glacial Ridge, kind of the basic sample units we had available to us. They're all just drawn on there. And then um, these are the seed lots, the seed lot information that we had to go with that. And of course we can get a lot of GIS data um, from the web. I mean there's there's good access to soil data and this sort of thing, and ultimately we can add in climate data. Um, and then overlaying all this, and you get this, this sort of polygon, which you want, which ideally has identical seeding, identical soil characteristics, and the same management for the last 10 years. That's what we were hoping for. And then you put a, tra a transect across that. Well, more or less. We're, that's part of why we're still working on this data set, is trying to, to make sure that we actually do have the data we think we have, which is not straightforward. So the field sampling took place June to September. Um, transects were plotted across the gradient of polygons. So what we had 10 plots per transect, and we tried, if there was any sort of a slope, we tried to go up and down that slope with our transect. And then the, the, the plots were across that. And that we chose that, that as kind of the, the way to capture the most species on a given transect. Um, and then we added in a time constrained botanist walk, which our field crew would then just wander around this polygon and try to find species that they didn't find on the transect. And we felt that was important because no transect is going to pick up rare things. So we wanted to make sure that we got as, as good a sample as possible. And this is what it looked like in the field. This, on the top, is that left? Yeah, the top left. You can see, that's, that's what our plot frame looked like. They were a half by one meter plot frame, and we had subunits. We're not doing cover. We're doing um, species presence and absence. And the way this works, it's a nested frequency plot. And so we start with the smallest subunit, and we have a data sheet that says, okay, what species did you find in that smallest subunit? And then you don't ever record that again. That's just in the smallest. And you go on to the next subunit, add any new species, and so forth and so forth. Then you flip the plot and, and do the next whole side. So you wind up with about five. You can, you can make these the size you need for your, your work. But you wind up so that really super abundant species are going to be in every plot, right? But maybe not in every small portion of that plot. So it gives you the opportunity to look at, at variation that you couldn't pick up with a one-size-fits-all plot. And by using frequency rather than cover, you get rid of some of the variation of different observers, which is important. Um, we also are trying to look at pollinators, which um, those guys are still all in the freezer right now. We haven't even pinned them yet. So, so I can't really tell you very much about that. But we deployed 30 bowl traps per sample poly polygon to collect the bees. They were out during the time the crew was, was uh, sampling, basically for a day at each site. Um, from this, we can at least develop a list of bowl-friendly <coughs> pollinators. And um, we can perhaps, if we're lucky, correlate the capture frequency with for richness or something like that. That's going to be pretty sketchy, and I don't expect that to be hugely useful. But what's really going to be useful is that you'll have a baseline for a future study. I think that's probably the, 
the biggest outcome of this is that you'll have a starting point of what, what we find. So just to show you that there is an analysis plan, <laughs> even though the analysis has not been carried out, um, we can look at the abundance of planted, non-planted, native, and non-native species. And this is something that will be in this database. And you'll be able, if you enter your data, to look at those percentages in your fields as well. So you can see, you know, are you getting a preponderance of planted species or is it other stuff? Um, the proportion of planted species that persist over time is important because we've got, in this retrospective study, we have 2002 to 2012. So um, some of the constructions have been in place longer than others. So we can kind of look at, see if there's a curve where you get some increase in species richness over time. Um, and we can look at covariates like the weather and the landscape. I think when a prairie was planted in relation to different um, times. What, you know, was it a rainy spring or you know, things like that. We can, those data are accessible to us as well and we can add those into our analysis. So statistically, um, it's a split plot with management unit as the whole plot and prairie type as a subunit. Um, and as, I, as I've alluded to, we just have to keep working to get this, this sample unit down. Um, we can use non-metric multidimensional scaling just to look for patterns in species reconstruction matrix um, with our covariates. And this is just a picture. It's not a statistical analysis, but it, it will let you see where, how your prairie varies with respect to wetness and, and how the species varies the species matrix. And if we, get a, if we actually wind up with a big enough sample size, we can use structural <coughs> equation models. And I've got a picture of how that would look uh, a little bit later. So questions that we hope to address. Does success vary with the seed mix? And the seed mix is a, is, is a very amorphous thing, it turns out. People don't just go out. Well, you're the people, you know. <laughs> you don't just go out and go to, you know, <coughs> go to Prairie Restoration Incorporated and say, um, you yeah, know, give me so much of this and that and that and give them the species list. You've got combines out there collecting seed from fields and we, you might do a test on them. We don't, do we really know what the, you know, what the survivability of those seeds is and the germinability and they're just, seed mix turns out to be a lot slipperier than I had hoped it would be. Um, but given that, we can look at how the seeds were sourced, and we can look at the success based on that. Does it vary? Is a combine really giving you a good, um, good success? And another question, how influential is precipitation before and after planting? And that's, that's something that I think is really, not that you have control over it, but I think it could give you some some pointers on, okay, if we have this kind of precipitation regime, maybe we gotta go back and do some, some replanting or adding in seeds or something like that. And are there interactions with soil properties? Obvious question. This structural equation model I was talking about, um, this, this could be really useful looking at the relative importance of different, um, different attributes. So we wanna look at for example, percentage of the planted seeds that established and relate that, is it mainly a function of, of the precipitation, oops, of the soil or of the area, you know, the surrounding area of the reconstruction? Is it, you know, if it's big, maybe it just is more successful than if it's a postage stamp. So these kinds of things, you can look at, at models like this and get relative influence. And that will tell you how much control you actually might have over the outcome of that restoration, which I think would make some people feel better and some people not feel so good. But I think it's important to know how much control you can actually um, expect to have. And hopefully, all of this will be possible based on the data that will be put in this database. And that's really the, the thing I find the most, the most um, encouraging about about having this database to work with ultimately is that 
we can we can learn a lot from it if if people have the the time and the energy to put the data in.